Good morning. This week we will pay respects to America's pastor, Billy Graham, who will lie in honor in the rotunda in the Capitol. When Billy Graham spoke of God's grace, the world listened. And right now, there's a lot of communities that are in need of healing. And it's my prayer that as we honor his legacy by remembering his faithful devotion to sharing God's love to us, I will remember the, the power of genuine love that comes from loving one another. This month also marks the beginning of bigger paychecks for people all across this country, thanks to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And not only are more families keeping more of their hard-earned dollars, they're also seeing their utility bills reduced. Companies are passing along savings uh, in their gas and electric bills. Avista is headquartered in Spokane, Washington, and they just announced customers uh, in Washington, Oregon, and Idaho will be seeing lower bills. And you just think about what that means to families around the kitchen table trying to make ends meet. They're going to have more money in their pocket. I heard from a gentleman just recently in my district who said the, the boost in his paycheck means that he can make his house insurance payment and buy groceries. And you, you know, we heard at the time when uh, that tax reform would be Armageddon, crumbs, more recently we heard unpatriotic. All those claims couldn't be further from the truth. Tax reform gives people hope and it's the beginning of a brighter future for many that felt like they were being forgotten. Today we also have Congressman Kevin Yoder with us. He's from the 3rd District in Kansas. Under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the average fa family in his district will see a tax cut of 2,728. They will also be seeing their utility bills drop. He hit the road visiting some businesses recently and he's here to share a little bit more about his, uh, the feedback that he got. So Kevin, thank you for being here. Well, thank you, Kathy. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Kathy's right. Uh, many of us were home in our districts last week talking to our constituents about what matters most to them, what's on their minds, and uh, the tax cuts are starting to hit paychecks for uh, a lot of our constituents. And so, like many of my colleagues, I went around my district and met with uh, many businesses from big box retailers to um, small tech companies to manufacturers uh, to, to financial institutions all across the board talking to uh, employees uh, from bank tellers to checkout clerks about what these tax cuts mean to them. And, you know, in Washington, this tends to be a philosophical debate sometimes about what good tax policy is. But back home in places like Kansas, uh, this means uh, bigger paychecks. Uh, this means a greater opportunity for our constituents. Uh, it means small business growth. It means investment in our community. Uh, and it means a renewed sense of optimism. You know, I think many of my constituents are astonished to actually find out that it was true that they're getting a tax cut, that they're actually getting bigger paychecks because of our bill, partly because of the misinformation that has been uh, uh, portrayed uh, in, in many stories, uh, but partly because they're just not used to seeing something good come out of Washington, D.C. They're expecting their taxes to go up or another burden to be placed on them and their families. And to actually know that they're receiving thousands more in their paycheck for the average family, uh, it was a really impressive set of conversations I had with, with folks across the district. And I wanted to give you sort of three uh, takeaways ways that I, that I heard from uh, the variety of, of folks that I visited with. First of all, there are bonuses being felt on top of the tax cuts. There are being bonuses being felt by hourly wage earners at many businesses. Uh, I went to Home Depot, right, um, in my community, and Home Depots across the country, uh, and uh, have uh, received bonuses uh, or given bonuses to their employees. So in addition to mixing paint and testing out some power tools. Uh, I also visited with employees about what those bonuses mean to that, mean to them, and including uh, stories about employees who were there as little as two weeks, who actually hadn't even received their first paycheck, who actually got a $200 bonus. And so that's being felt far and wide. But it wasn't just about bonuses. I visited a local Walmart in Shawnee, Kansas, uh, where they've actually increased benefits to their employees, and the employees are actually really excited about this. There's a buzz uh, amongst the folks there. Paid maternity leave to 10 weeks, paid paternity leave to six weeks, uh, and even uh, helping with adoption. So lots of benefits flowing. And frankly, it's not just about those big box stores. I visited with small businesses, IT firms, and continue to hear that renewed sense of optimism and the excitement about these tax cuts. That's the buzz back in the district. It's about the great great American comeback, and it was exciting to be uh, part of that last week to talk to our constituents. Many of my colleagues are doing the same, and that will continue uh, as the weeks go forward. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, yesterday I had the opportunity to meet with a number of the Parkland students. 
and uh, we had a really uh, really productive conversation about a lot of things. Of course, there was some talk about policy. Uh, there was talk about breakdowns at various levels of government uh, that failed those kids. Uh, but then we ultimately talked about our shared experience. And um, just know that tomorrow, Parkland, uh, the school reopens, and those kids are going to be going back to school. They're going to be high school students again. And you know, while they got an opportunity to participate in the uh, the legislative process and come up here and, and get a real uh, you know, kind of experience of democracy and civics, uh, they're going to be going back to school tomorrow. And I know there's a lot of trepidation as they go back, so keep them in your prayers because it's going to be difficult times, I'm sure, as they reopen that school and, you know, think through and maybe relive some of those experiences that are going to be out there. And just like we've been working through our, uh, you know, our different processes up here, they're going to be doing that back home. So keep them in your thoughts and prayers as they continue to meet with, uh, with our colleagues up here. Um, we're doing a lot of other things as well. We're continuing to work on the Good Light McCall bill. Uh, if you know back uh, two weeks ago we whipped that bill so we got a good starting point of where we are and what we need to do to come together as a conference uh, to meet those principles that President Trump laid out and that is to secure the border to start building the wall to end chain migration and the visa lottery and ultimately to fix the DACA problem uh, that was left on our doorstep uh, when Barack Obama created a program that uh, that had no resolution but ultimately had to be solved by somebody else and now is that time to solve that problem and we're working very hard to get that consensus uh, when I was back home I know I got to meet with a number of local businesses got to throw out the first pitch at the University of Louisiana Lafayette game uh, they gave me a New Jersey my other one uh, didn't hold up quite so well but uh, I do have a New Jersey from them now but um, I also met with a maritime advisory group this is a group I meet with every year and for the last eight years the topic of conversation mostly revolved around regulations uh, that made it harder for them to create jobs made it harder for them to grow their business and compete and we meet right by the port of new orleans one of the most active ports in the nation and uh, they for again for eight years the biggest problem they faced were regulations that made no sense that just made it harder for them to compete and to hire more people uh, the great thing about this last meeting is that uh, they were actually talking about the opportunities they're going to have to grow now because of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, the fact that they're now uh, more competitive and that they're going to be able to give more back to their workers, something we're seeing all across the country. So it was really exciting to hear from a lot of small-owned, family-owned businesses uh, that are now thriving uh, because we got government out of the way and actually gave them more of their money back so that they can help increase uh, the increase the pay of their workers and increase the quality of life for their workers too um, good morning as our nation continues to mourn and to try to heal from the tragic situation at stone Ben douglas high school where 17 innocent children were murdered we are learning more and more about the failures the inaction and the ignored warning that ultimately gave way to this horrific act as the investigations continue to look at how this happened, even after all the warnings, important debates are taking place to make sure nobody like this deranged Mr. Cruz person can get their hands on a firearm again. We recognize that includes strengthening our background check da uh, database. That is something, as many of you know, that we took up last year in December, the Fix Nix bill. We look for the Senate to continue to work towards that. We look to having that bill become law. The bottom line is that every American wants safe communities, safe schools, safe from violence, safe from crime, and safe from drugs. These are all the priorities that we are committed to. Today, the House will also vote on legislation from Ann Wagner and Mimi Walters to stop online sex trafficking. This is legislation that we have been working on for more than eight years. Currently, there are 105,000 children in America that are victims to sex trafficking. 70% of them are sold online. Tomorrow, the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Health will hold their first of three hearings to combat the nation's opioid epidemic. Every day, 175 Americans die from opioid-related overdoses. This is not just a number. Those are brothers, sisters, mothers and fathers, 
and friends who lost their battle to a devastating enemy. I look forward to bringing legislation to the floor this year to help fight and end our nation's opioid epidemic once and for all. We will also not have votes on Wednesday and Thursday in honor of lying in honor of Billy Graham. And I think ending today, I'd re just remind individuals of what one of the quotes from Billy Graham. The will of God will not take us where the grace of God cannot sustain us. <clears throat> well, let me pick up where, where Kevin left off. If there is any American whose life uh, and life's work deserves to be honored by laying an honor in the U.S. Capitol, it's Billy Graham. Uh, so it's an honor for us here in the Capitol to receive uh, Reverend Graham's casket and to greet his family. So um, that's something we're very proud to do and reflective of. Um, first off, you know, I want to say uh, all of us have been deeply troubled uh, by this Parkland shooting. Um, this is a time for asking tough questions. How could this have happened? What can we do to make our schools safer in the future? We're going to be looking at the system failures that occurred here. We're going to be talking about what changes are needed. Um, as you know, uh, the House has already taken action to improve our background check system. We clearly believe that there is a gap in our background check system that needs to be filled. Uh, we also put in place sweeping mental health reform, but those reforms um, still have a ways to go to be implemented. Uh, these are the kinds of things we're going to be discussing with our members, with, with the Senate, and with the President. Um, I had the fortune of being able to go meet with uh, people in Broward County, first responders, local elected leaders, just to hear firsthand um, about what had happened in the ensuing chaos and, and this, the breakdowns that occurred. Um, so this is something that, that we're, we're very, very, very troubled by, and we are going to be having the kind of conversations we need to have with our, with our fellow members um, to do what we can do to try and make sure something like this doesn't happen again. And again, um, there are a lot of system failures that we need to look at here. Uh, on a more positive note, um, I also got to spend time with, with local businesses in Wisconsin last week, <clears throat> learning about how the tax reform law is making them better and making them much more competitive. It's really something. Uh, these small businesses told me that tax reform is enabling them to increase capital investments in their people and their equipment and their training. I've talked to many business leaders, small businesses, who are now you know, confident that they can go make, make a, make, take a risk and expand employees, expand operations, giving bonuses, giving raises, adding to the benefits. This is what we are seeing all over the country. Wages for hardworking Americans are increasing and paychecks are getting bigger. And this is all thanks to tax reform. And people are actually noticing it. A new survey last week revealed that confidence among small business owners has hit a record high driven by tax reform. A New York Times poll showed that the majority of Americans now support tax reform. 51% of Americans now approve of the new tax reform law. It's up from 37% in November because I think you saw a lot of the rhetoric um, that, was, uh, that was flying around here in November um, is not meeting the reality that people are actually seeing in their own paychecks. This is heartening. The American people's confidence in our economy is coming back, and rightly so. Tax reform is growing our economy. It is create, creating opportunities, and it's helping hardworking Americans the most. Questions? When do you think we could see a vote in the House on banning bump stocks? Uh, well, as you know, the House passed our bill that, in, that gives the ATF um, direction to go deal with this issue, um, also fixing the background checks. We're waiting to see what the Senate can do. Um, and we'll we'll find out what the Senate can do, and then we'll we'll address that then. Rachel. We we obviously think the Senate should should take our whole bill, but if the Senate cannot do that, then we'll then we'll discuss and cross that bridge when we get to it. Yeah. Well, uh, Patrick called me early that morning, uh, Patrick McHenry, who's, who, who represents the district that the Graham family lives in. Uh, I quickly turned around and called Mitch McConnell, and, and we got together and decided this is, this is obviously something we should do. And we turned that decision around. The president called me as well that, that morning. So between Mitch, the president, myself, and Patrick McHenry, we made that decision very quickly. Alan. Okay, that's, that's like six questions in one there, Alan, four. Okay, let me see if I can get 
First of all, um, you know, I'm not going to micromanage this. Uh, second of all, uh, I'm not exactly sure what Pat and Joe are doing in their bill, so I can't really specifically comment on that. That's a Senate bill. Um, but we do know that there are gaps in the background check system that need to be plugged. We passed a bill to do that, um, and we think that should get done clearly. Um, let me just say this on, on, on we shouldn't be banning guns for law-abiding citizens. We should be focusing on making sure that citizens who should not get guns in the first place don't get those guns. And that is why we see a big breakdown in the system here. In this particular case, there were a lot of breakdowns from local law enforcement to the FBI getting tips that they didn't follow up on to, you know, school resource officers who are trained to protect kids in these schools and, and who didn't do that. And that, to me, is probably the most stunning one of them all. So there's a lot that we have to look at, but what we want to do is protect people's rights while making sure that people who should not get guns do not get those guns. Well, Chad. Oh, teachers. Uh, look, um, as, as we, have, we have Sheriff Rutledge is, is, has a bill um, that we're looking at as well that addresses this issue. He's a sheriff from Jacksonville, as you may know. And we're looking at the Rutledge bill, but that is really a question for local government, local school boards, local states. As a parent myself and as a citizen, I think it's a good idea. But as Speaker of the House, I think we need to respect federalism and respect local, local jurisdictions. You blurted it out. Mr. Scalise talked about meeting with the Parkland students yesterday, and you talked about the legislative process here. Uh, what would you view, and I'd like to hear Mr. Scalise as well, as a defeat on not being able to address some of these concerns from Parkland after they've come up here and, as you say, engaged in the legislative process? Well, I think it's good that they're coming up and engaging the legislative process. We should encourage it, especially with, with our, our youth. So this is, again, there are a lot of questions that need answers. And there are a lot of members who are putting their heads together to figure out where the common ground is. What we want to do is find common ground to make a difference. You want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, as people are contemplating new laws, I think the most important thing we can look at is what about all the laws that are already on the books that were not enforced, that were not properly implemented? You know, I think what angers me the most is, is when I see breakdowns with law enforcement. Uh, the FBI had this guy's name on a silver platter, uh, not just innuendo and there were a lot of students in that school that said we think he's going to be a school shooter he himself said he wanted to be a professional school shooter and it was posted under his name and ultimately turned over to the FBI and somewhere along the way in the FBI's chain of command they let it go I think we ought to ask those tough questions and hold people accountable. There are really good people at the FBI, but clearly there are people at the FBI that chose to let this go, and I think we ought to know about this. And then at the end of the day, when you look at local law enforcement, you know, and the sheriff's been very outspoken in a lot of ways, uh, but I think what angered me the most is that there was a sheriff's deputy trained and armed at the school, assigned to protect the school, <coughs> And, and he hit out instead of protecting those students and confronting the shooter. I wouldn't be here right now if it wasn't for law enforcement confronting the shooter in my case. Uh, and it's, it's really disappointing that, that ultimately somebody didn't go into that school that was there and armed to protect those kids. Casey. These, you're meeting with these Parkland students. You have a daughter who's that age. Can you look at them and say that you are doing enough to First of all, there was a colossal breakdown in the system locally. So uh, there was a colossal breakdown, and we need to get to the bottom of this, how these breakdowns occurred. From what Steve just mentioned, to the armed officer who was in the school at that time, to the FBI who failed to follow up on a glaring tip that this young man wanted to shoot up a school. So that's pretty profound. Then we also know that there are problems in the system with background checks where people slip through the cracks. Those are things, we already passed a bill to fix that. We want to finish by getting final law on that thing. So, of course we want to listen to these kids, but we also want to make sure that we protect people's due process rights and legal constitutional rights while making sure that people who should not get guns don't get them. This kid was clearly one of those people. I realize that, but the question is, uh, enough. I think this speaks to bigger questions of our culture. What are we teaching our kids? Look at the violence in our culture. Look at, look at what they're getting um, as far as, 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 as a culture that's providing them. There's bigger questions here than a narrow law. 
What about law enforcement? What about school resource officers? What about the FBI? What about background checks? Those are all things that we have to get lots of answers to. At the end of the day or at the beginning of the day, we also have to ask ourselves about the kind of culture that's creating these kinds of people. And then, do we have the kind of mental health laws that we need in the books? Again, we passed overhaul of the entire mental health system. The question is, are we making sure that that overhaul is doing what it's supposed to be doing to making sure that people who are like this do not get those kinds of guns. That's where we should focus our problem to be solved, which is the people who shouldn't get guns without trying to take away a citizen's rights. Thank you.